Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm with United Airlines and been working in the revenue management department there for about 22 years. Um, and I wanted to start, I know Laurie already gave a little bit of a background on how the pandemic looked in the travel industry, but I wanted to give a slightly different perspective on it, um, just to sort of put it in perspective with some other things that have happened in history for airlines. So this is just a graph that's, that the Bureau of Transportation Statistics in the, in the DOT puts out of monthly employments for US air carriers. So it's basically volume of travelers on US air carriers month after month, year after year. And you can see during the, the years here, there's not a huge amount of variance there. Um, you know, we are an industry that breathlessly awaits the beginning of the next quarter and we figure out if our revenues are up 3% or 3.5%. So those little bits make a huge difference for us, like a lot of other, other industries, to be honest. This is the, you know, the Great Recession. The, the, this is the period around 2008, 2009 when we had the financial crisis. And as you probably remember, a number of carriers either went out of business or our carrier was sort of on the brink. Um, and that was a really rough time for us. So that's what that looked like. A little dip, not so bad. This is what COVID-19 looks like in relation to that Great, great Recession. There is nothing, nothing that we've seen um, like this ever. And, and to put that in perspective, going into all of this, um, you guys have probably heard this many times before, the airline industry said up until about 2020, uh, March or so, that if you've got enough cash on hand to weather a, a 9-11 event, a, a, a catastrophe of that sort of magnitude, then you're in pretty good shape as a company to, to be an a ongoing business in the, the foreseeable future. This is what 9-11 looked like, looked like compared to COVID-19. So the comparison just isn't even there. There's nothing, um, we've had nothing like this before. So we had a lot to deal with. And before I go any further on how we dealt with it and what we're doing in the future, I also wanted to set the stage a little bit. I'm not sure how much all of you know about revenue management in the airline business or in the travel industry in general. So I wanted to at least give a little bit of background on that. Um, Traditionally, at large carriers like ours, um, there's sort of two um, uh, roles, two, two primary roles within the revenue management organization. There's pricing and there's inventory management. Some call it yield management. Some just call it revenue management. Um, and on the pricing side, we have a bunch of analysts who's, they use some systems. One of them, we use one that's by Sabre, Sergey's company, uh, so we thank him for that. Um, we, they use systems that are monitoring competitive fares. Uh, taking into account market performance, share data, things like that, and then you know their own user strategies and, automate, and automated and, and sort of business rule engine type strategies. Put all that together, and they every day, multiple times a day, are filing fares for tens of thousands of connecting city pairs that airlines serve um, through, through non-stops and through connecting markets. Um, so they just put out a menu of fares that are pretty much typical or sort of applicable to multiple days in the future. Revenue management or yield management or inventory management, on the other hand, takes prices as an input, um, but it also takes booking history, offer history, flight schedules, and sort of a little bit of secret sauce, the stuff that we like to say is unique about our RM system versus everybody else's, and user adjustments. Again, we got a bunch of users here too. Put it into a big RM system, and that, that builds what becomes ultimately the offers that are made to customers. What's the cheapest fare to have available on any given day? So if, for example, these are the fares filed in some random made up market YYY to ZZZ, on November 24th, the 2 p.m. flight, that's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, maybe it's a pretty well-leveraged day because the Sunday after Thanksgiving is a very well-leveraged day. And so maybe we've closed the bottom five fares or something like that. And we do, the ARM system and the analysts running it decide that they can maximize revenues for the airline by not selling the cheapest fares on that day. Um, and that's the kind of thing that happens all the time. And by the way, this also, Laurie mentioned continuous pricing several times. I can't, can't, show this to you without then explaining a little bit here what that means, which is, whether you know it or not, when you buy a ticket, it's always got a letter. And it's, there's no science behind these letters. These are United's letters, YBM, QV, S, T, L, and K, and there's actually more of them than that. American Airlines has their own letters. Delta has their own letters. They're all different. They're just random. They don't mean anything other than, except Y does, but, but anyway. They don't mean much other than it's a bucket. It's just a bucket that, and, and the, the sad truth is that in order for big carriers like United and Delta and American to sell products all across the world through at travel agencies all across the world, we have to live in this world where we send our availability out with these letters, and that's the way that travel agencies get it. And, and our prices are filed through something called ATPCO, and that's where we're on the right. So revenue management is just taking all these letter classes with prices filed in them and shutting some down so that um, we can control how much we're offering on an airplane. Continuous pricing, which is what Lori talked about, is sort of this new 
I mean, you put air quotes around technology because this doesn't sound like much, but the ability to, to have fares between the filed prices. Um, sounds easy enough, but it turns out just because of legacy systems in the industry, it's hard to do. But we're doing that lately. In fact, we've got a lot of it out in the marketplace right now. Oh, sorry. This is me on the bottom. So I got a se several teams. So I'm the sort of the systems guy at United um, for, for pricing and revenue management. We have several teams that do, you know, we work with IT to build and enhance our systems. We got revenue integrity team that, that plugs revenue leaks. Um, we got business intelligence teams building tools for our, our analysts, all sorts of stuff like that. So before the pandemic, in this ignorance is bliss period, um, where we thought things were really good and they were just gonna stay that way, and finally, by God, we we're a mature industry. We're no longer a nonprofit industry like the airline industry had been for you know, all the years of its existence prior to that. Things are great. Everything was trending towards more. Um, so we, you, know, you probably know that airlines were adding basic economy and then flexible products and upgrade products. And so there were more, fi more fares filed, puts a little bit of pressure on your systems. Because again, we're filing them in tens of thousands of markets multiple times a day. And on the RM side, everything was about more there too. We, all, we still had our RM system, which by the way, at United we call Gemini. I'll, I might refer to that a couple times. Um, we were trying to put in other, you know, an, other influences on demand into our systems, like competitor airline fares and other products and non-airline data. Maybe there's, there's things out in the marketplace that we don't have in our system today that would, in, could influence our demand forecasts. And other United flight offers. I mean, we were just trying to add more and more conditions to our, to our revenue management system. Everything was about more and also more revenue. I mean, things were just nicely moving along. Um, and then all of a sudden, of course, then on came the pandemic. And I mean, things kind of went south very, very quickly. Lori already described that. I showed you at the beginning also. Um, there was a lot that went wrong. And for the first six months of it, it was back to the Stone Ages for us. Um, we were, you know, going into our native reservation system and plugging holes here and there. Initially, this started with deeply slashed schedules. Laurie mentioned how deeply we had to cut them. Wild no-shows. You know, we would cut our schedule, and then flights, after you cut your schedule, you reaccom all your passengers um, that were on those flights. And this, the, the system, because this works well in normal times, will overbook some flights because we can usually then compensate some customers to get off of them, things like that, so that in the future, um, you know, you, if, if, if you had to overbook a few people, in order to reaccommodate people during a schedule change, you know, that sort of happens sometimes. Well, this time we ended up with flights booked to four digits um, with 200 seats on them. Um, and that looked frightening to us, but at the same time, they all flew half full at best because nobody wanted to fly. Um, so the schedule change that happened at the beginning, it was a, it was a nightmare on our systems, but in the end, it kind of didn't matter. Um, we turned off the forecasts, essentially, is the way you'd put it. There, there was excess capacity. As little as the capacity was, there was still too much capacity for the people who wanted to fly. So we essentially zeroed out the forecasts. Um, throughout the pandemic, and especially you know, as things changed from time to time, we were facing these inconsistent, unstable global restrictions. And I'll give you an example. So the government of Australia, so United had a couple of flights a day to Australia, kind of in the early stages of the pandemic, sometimes one, sometimes two. And the government of Australia would not allow more than it was a varying number from one day to the next, but 20 to 30 passengers a day in total deplaned from United flights in Australia. So we were flying two 787s a day that we could not load more than 20 to 30 passengers on in total on the two. Um, fortunately for us, cargo sort of say, was saving the data. The reason we were able to justify flying those flights is because we filled them up with cargo too. Um, but on the passenger side and from the RM system side, how do you manage, how do you optimize inventory on flights where you can't board more passengers than any single cabin um, has seats for them. It just doesn't make sense. The systems were kind of just turned off. Schedule volatility continued throughout this, this crisis. What, this is important for RM systems because RM systems basically have three inputs. They got fares, they got schedules, and they got past demand observations, you know, bookings. Well, past demand observations were obviously garbage, and now schedules are garbage too. When two, two out of three of your inputs are, are garbage, there's not much you can do with it. And then, you know, eventually things started to recover, um, but that brought its own new challenges because you'd like to say that, you know, we had, the, we had these COVID surges and then, it, then things got better. Another surge and things got better. You'd like to say that you learned from the first surge, but the truth of the matter is the demand, be, the passenger behavior following the first surge was not the same as the passenger behavior following the second surge. There really, what, you'd like to say you could learn from the first surge and the first recovery, but it, it didn't really work that way. Things were different every single time there was a new COVID surge. 
So we spend a lot of time, like really most of our time, kind of plugging holes and, and taping things up. Um, but we also did find some time, first of all, and maybe foremost during the time, to give users more uh, versatile tools to sort of hand manage things um, in the RM system. So the system was, I say we turned the forecast off, the system was still on because users put in heuristics and we built sort of enhanced the tools to help them with the heuristics so that those rare flights that actually filled up would actually gain a little, get a little bit of money. And we also spent some time, and this was somewhat of a cost neutral thing for us to some extent, and we also had you know, money already spent on this, so we also spent a lot of time continuing to move our RM systems and our availability calculation to the cloud which has the, is sort of paving the way for getting back to normal someday and being able to expand our systems again. And so, to paraphrase someone I won't even name, you, 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 go, to, you go into a crisis with the systems you have, not the systems you wish you had. Um, and boy, these, there's little pictures back here, darn it. They didn't show up on this, <laughs> this uh, little icons. I, I apparently colored them too light. But um, anyway, so we had, during the, the pandemic, we were, you know, lucky to have certain features of our systems that were less important before the pandemic that became very important during the pandemic, which is, for example, we, our system forecasts, and I think this is somewhat unique in the, in the industry, we forecast demand by passenger type, not by those letter classes that you saw earlier. We forecast business passengers as a unit. We forecast leisure passengers as a unit. We also forecast awards and a few other, you know, groups and a few other smaller, not as consequential passenger um, segments. And that meant that, that during the pandemic, when, as Laurie explained, business demand was exhibiting very different behavior than leisure demand, um, we were able to sort of make the adjustments to the right place, the right spots in our forecast when we started using the forecasts again. We also had this thing called blended forecast where we're able to take some percent of demand from pre-COVID and some percent of demand post-COVID and combine that into a forecast that sort of worked, seemed to work as best it could during the pandemic. And we also, lastly, we had this forecast accuracy metric, we call it EDGAR, but I won't tell you what that stands for. Um, which, you know, if you haven't gotten the impression by now, a lot of this was sort of by touch and feel, because that's all we had to go with during the pandemic. The forecast accuracy metric, which is a lot, easy, a lot harder to, to, to build than you might think, helped us because as the, the forecast returned, analysts were able to apply their sort of okay, I think this is the right forecast now because this, is just, this just happened to um, COVID numbers. And th they could get sort of pretty quick feedback on whether it turned out to be accurate or not. And so they could take the forecast accuracy feedback and uh, adjust things a lot more quickly than if they were having to wait for, for actual booking data to come in and, and for flights to depart. So we had, we had so with things that, are, that we thought were unique to our system that really were, we, we're glad that we had them. And then we also had some things that we desperately wished we had had. These are the things that we were like working on before the pandemic started that we desperately wished we had during the pandemic. Um, one, one is more passenger types. Um, you know, I talked about business and leisure. The truth of the matter is those are the, the, the passengers are not, don't just fly in two monolithic groups like that. Leisure in particular has something that we in the airline business call VFR for visiting friends and relatives. And we kind of lump that in with people going to Disney World or whatever, all as one big leisure category. But the truth is they're two very different categories of passengers. And there's more to, the, to it than that as well. But VFR, visiting friends, and the, the people who are going to visit family or friends, became kind of about the only traffic that existed during the pandemic for a while um, that we could, we could observe in large numbers. And, and they have, tend to have di very different behavior patterns than, than you know, people going to Disney World. They travel in smaller numbers uh, in, a, in, in the party size. They book closer to departure. Um, they, their willingness to pay is a little bit different. There's things like that that we sort of wish we had, had developed and we had it in our, in our minds for a long time, this visiting friends and relatives as a, as a passenger segment in our system, and we hadn't. Top-down forecasting. We wish we had a system that forecasted demand for the whole day and used a fabulous consumer demand or customer choice model to, to spread that demand across all of our schedule on that day. Because if your schedule is changing as much as it was during the pandemic for us, it's really hard to live with a system like we did have, which was something that basically forecasts each path as an independent thing. Um, schedule volatility is not good for a system that, that assumes path history to be sort of independent of each other. So that's something we, and then, well, I had a magic eight, maybe it's almost there. There's a magic eight ball back there somewhere. So clairvoyance, I mean, if, I wish I had a nickel for every person, I don't even put them in categories, who said that they had a, 
a, usually it was machine language or AI model that was going to tell us what was going to happen next in COVID. Um, because the fact of the matter is, I think most of that ended up being an exercise in guessing or an exercise in, in um, you know, goal seeking or something like that. And they weren't very useful. We really do wish we had that magical, you know, machine learning model that will take in variables that you didn't even know were important and turn it into a demand forecast that works in a crisis like this, but we didn't have it. Um, and I don't think anybody has it, but one of the people on this panel is gonna develop it in the next year or two, I'm sure. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we wish we had, we didn't have it. Um, and this is my last slide. So going forward, you know, the things that I think are important to us and probably other carriers too, are maybe a little different than they were coming into the pandemic, but not, it's not like we're throwing everything out and starting over. Um, so for example, I'm gonna not do this in order actually now that I think about it. Um, I talked about passenger types already. This, this visiting friends and relatives thing for us, I think is something we're gonna stick with and, and really figure out how to put it into our system. Although the, the question you can ask yourself is, do they, are they the same in the pandemic as they will be in the future? We saw them to be very distinct in the pandemic. Will, they be, will that passenger segment be the same in the future? Probably not, but, but we think it's gonna be a pretty important thing. Um, there's, you could think about you know, different flavors of business. Business traffic, travel, travel is sometimes now someone who's working remotely that travels into the office from time to time. That's sort of a bigger thing than it was before. Um, so there's different passenger segments that might emerge from the pandemic that we re really hadn't thought about as much prior to the pandemic. Um, I mentioned the top-down forecast. That's something that, you know, the, the, the way to explain that, at least in my mind, is when in a, a stable schedule environment, you really don't need something like a top-down forecast that forecasts the whole day and then spreads the, 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 the demand out on, the, on all the paths that they might take in your schedule. But if the schedule is volatile, and I think the schedules, while they will settle down, will remain volatile, volatile for some time to come because the fact of the matter is our network departments don't really know what's the best use of our aircraft right now. So I think they're gonna stay volatile for a while and we're gonna need this top-down forecast a little bit more than we used to before. So we're gonna be refocusing the way we build a forecast in the future. And the last thing is these sort of these two kind of go together, the top left and the bottom right. We have what's called the conditional, de conditional demand forecast, which essentially means we take into account to the extent we can, the conditions that you looked at when you bought your ticket in the first place. Well, all that really means today is what the price of that ticket was on that flight, which doesn't, isn't very much really. We wanna also take into account all these other conditions, competitive offers, other United itineraries, other products on, you know, like first class, other cabins, economy plus, all that stuff. We wanna take into account every context, I guess what, it, what this boils down to is context is everything when you have a system that forecasts elasticity. The reason for that is you know, our system relies on a, a, a volume forecast and an, an elasticity forecast. And if elasticity doesn't just mean what a customer is willing to pay, elasticity really means what a customer is willing to pay United for this flight, given all the other offers that are in front of that customer at the time that they make that decision. And without all these other contextual variables in our system, we're gonna have a, have a tough time really making that work for us. So we're trying to figure out how to put all these new conditions into our system. That means a lot more data into a system that is already a voracious data system, um, and that's hard to do. We're taking this approach on the bottom, labeled continuous as the new black, everything's kind of, kind of going continuous. We're trying to take this, all this discrete data and trying to turn, it, turn our demand forecast into, instead of, demand, instead of forecasting 200 virtual buckets of passengers, we want to turn it into a, a continuous demand curve um, and make that be the source of our forecast. And our optimization as well, and we've already got it out there in pricing. So we've done experiments, in fact, during the pandemic, we had some people working on this where we've shown that we can shrink the amount of processing time that our system takes overnight by a pretty drastic uh, uh, percentage if we manage to turn the, the optimization algorithm from a discrete algorithm into a continuous algorithm. So there's a lot of promising work there because the fact of the matter is, you know, sure, we put everything in the cloud and the cloud might be infinite, um, but it still costs a lot of money and it's still hard to, to deal with small numbers issues. So I, we think that a continuous, um, continuous algorithms are, are gonna help us solve a lot of our problems going forward. And that's all I got. Thank you. Oh, there you go. All right.